I Wanna Jump Like Dee Dee, with me, Jar Sibold, is the music podcast that does music a bit differently. I'm talking to some incredible musicians, DJs and producers about how they use an experimental mindset to fuel their own creativity, pursue new challenges, overcome fears, bounce back from mistakes. So my guest today is um, is a, a tireless, persistently sort of forward thinking, and I'm, and I'm going to say warrior, who's uh, for me his influence is, is impossible to, to really quantify. The band that he founded um, and leads is one, again, whose influence is really equally impossible to quantify. So it's my enormous pleasure to welcome John Dwyer of OCs. John, welcome. A pleasure. Yeah, thanks for having me. No problem. So um, I, I, was, I was looking for, um, you know, like my, my own sort of inspiration as how to, how to describe OCs. Uh, I'm, I'm sure you've sort of discussed this before. So please, please just sort of bear with me. So I... I and I was really struggling. So I looked on on Castle Records at the at the notes at the sleeve notes for for um, Orc and Mutilator, mm-hmm. and and it and it felt like every word or phrase that I read really sort of described OCs. And I and and, and again, just humor me. Uh, I'll just take a, take a few seconds just to sort of read out some of these words. And it was just incredible. So like hurtling, bruising, brooding, hypnotic phalanx of double drummers muscular veins of gold through granite heavy lush stately and then i got to like my real real kind of favorite which was sort of cauldron of chaos <laughs> i thought it was just just immense and, and I, I was reading these and i was just like wow this this i I'd never really sort of come across this before he's like everything that i read it just described the band for me as to, as to, and, I, and I, I find that like totally kind of mind-blowing and, and pretty pretty kind of unique and it made me sort of realize that there's nothing that actually you can't compactly describe the band. And I, I really like that. That's a, I'll take that as a compliment that it's yeah. uh, to put us in a box. I think what you're reading into there is the conglomeration of me and Matt Jones from Castleface. Um, who are both just stoners. <laughs> and we both inadvertently become sort of wordsmiths when writing a bio. Like I've definitely written bios for bands on our label and they're like, what the fuck? Like you can tell they're like, it's a bit far out. And I was like, well, I'm just describing how it makes me feel. But to, uh, you know, jump in with like imagematic uh, words to describe places that some of the stuff we do takes me personally while we're working on it. Yeah. Isn't, isn't too hard to come by, you know? I mean, I, I grew up on like fantastical shit. So I think describing music and its journey in a fantastical way is sort of second nature for me. Yeah, but, yeah. You know, I, nothing is worse sometimes than an artist statement too. Like I remember reading an artist statement for Chris Burton, Burt Burton, the artist, yeah. the yeah. performance artist, one time and I was sorely disappointed and it taught me a valuable lesson because I always thought he was fucking great and I still do. But to read how he was describing it from this, yeah. it was old as well, but he was like, you know, I walk in the room and I light my arms on fire and then I just fucking leave without saying anything. And I was like, <laughs> what? I was like, that's it? Like, I was like, we already saw that. So sometimes to me, looking behind the curtain and seeing something that's very literal yeah. can be a bit underwhelming. So I think yeah. like we sort of dress it up, you know, it's also tough to write about yourself and not sound like a dick to be like, you know, like, yeah, the heaviest shit. You're like, fuck off. So like, <laughs> you know, we kind of we kind of have fun with it. You know, we do that a lot with a lot of the bands. We 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 write stuff that's sort of just like from the hip. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, getting pretty like you know literary with it is always kind of fun, like poetic. You know, I get a lot of blogs being like, <laughs> like with the Bent Arcana record. I can't remember what it was, but it was some like you know allusion to outer space or something, which in my mind was kind of like where this music is from, and. Uh, <laughs> The guy was like, try and fucking decipher this person. Like he was just totally not into it at all. He was like, yeah, anyway, guys, you know, and I was like, oh, so it can go either way, you know? So, I mean, I mean like, you know, sort of going back to, you, you know, your youth, what, 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 was, what was the young you like? I grew up with my mom and uh, thank God for that, you know, my stepdad and, mm. uh, they're both working people. My mom was a secretary at a college yeah. that's sort of half non-existent now. And my stepdad was a, a handyman. He still is. He yeah. works at uh, Old Tomes now. Yeah. And uh, I just spent a lot of time. I was an only child. I have a half brother, two half brothers and a half sister, but I didn't grow up with them. I had moved yeah. out basically. And two of them lived with my dad. So we didn't spend a lot of time together. I mean, we grew up together, but we weren't, we didn't spend a lot yeah. of time together. So 
I was alone a lot and I think um, definitely suffered from a lot of the uh, only child syndromes of like same as me a baby yeah but also because of that because I didn't have a lot of other people in my immediate household to bounce off of because my parents were working a lot I definitely found a lot of uh, peace in um, things like role-playing games and reading and yeah uh, and and later on music you know that was like ways to occupy my mind and I was always pretty active like I always wanted to be making something like I was drawing all the time when I was a kid and mm. once I got into reading I was like insatiable like mm. definitely still to this day will like it's so weird to think I can't tell if this is like nerdy or not or what but like every <laughs> now and then I'll just get like a, a craving to be reading like I'll, in the middle of the day I'll just stop what I'm doing I'll be like I have to read right now I'll just leave <laughs> you know like, I'll just be like I have to go lay down and read for a while and like I'm so thankful for that you know but that's definitely part of that and that definitely lended itself to a bunch of like where I ended up as an adult. Yeah. I mean, do, do you think it like, like being, uh, it, I mean, it's funny, isn't it? I mean, everybody has sort of different experiences of, 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 of sort of childhood and, and, you know, kind of what they grew up around. And I mean, I mean, you know, sort of being an only child, I mean, do you think that that kind of like, you know, helped you, you know, with, with any kind of creativity and kind of like, cause you, you really sort of thinking for yourself quite a, quite a lot of the time. I mean, I, I, I kind of found that as well, you know, you spend a bit of time on your own and it's like, okay, well, how am I going to stimulate myself? I, I mean, I found myself too. Like once I got to be a teenager, I started searching out people that I thought were interesting, which is kind of how I felt my whole life, like surrounding myself with other people. Yeah. I mean, I remember like when I got to high school, I went to parochial school, you know, so I went to a Catholic school. My mm. mom get a good education, but it really it was just the fucking same, except with priests and nuns. And uh, <laughs> it was, you know, it was uh, boys and girls. It wasn't just a male school or anything. But uh, I remember immediately feeling, I mean, everybody I went to school with was fine. I didn't get into a lot of fights necessarily or anything like that, but I definitely yeah. didn't fit in. Like I remember yeah. being able, um, just feeling like, I was like, how the fuck am I gonna get along with any of these people? And then, uh, <laughs> then I saw like this big punk guy who was like, I don't know if he had like stayed back a couple of years or whatever, but he definitely looked older and he was like smoking cigarettes and he was fucking huge. He was like six feet tall already. And I was like, who's that guy? And then I think I bummed a cigarette off him. I was probably like 16 or 15. Maybe. Yeah. And uh, almost immediately he had like skull rings and shit. And uh, almost immediately he's like, you ever heard the misfits? And I was like, no. And then he gave me a tape of walk among us and I took it yeah. home and put it on and like at first was like I don't know if I like this but then couldn't stop listening to it and then yeah. he like opened the door for me for tons of shit and then started meeting people other people you know I had like a very core group of friends in school and yeah. a lot of that was based in music and yeah. smoking weed yeah you know, yeah yeah real, well that was a real doorway to meet other people they'd be like he has some weed and I was like well, let's go talk to that guy you know and <laughs> that sort of uh you know I, I searched outside because I didn't have uh, brothers and sisters to grow up with so I was definitely like yeah from friends, just out in the general public you know I remember like, like I, I kind of sort of like my my dad was sort of classically trained and you know I like he got me into playing the cello when I was a kid That's like good. from from like kind of eight years old but my my kind of like love for music was really like in the complete opposite end of the spectrum. It was like punk rock. And I could never kind of like just bring these two together as a teenage kid. You know, it's just like, I, I can't do this. I found myself like going to record shops. When I started going to record shops, just like this other world of just like, wow, it's somewhere in, in, the, in this kind of ether. And you're finding this, this alternate world and sort of seeing record covers of like, Susie and the Banshees and Killing Joke and you know kind of bands like those and it's just like wow this is just incredible. What did you what did you kind of like you know your your kind of where you grew up um you know you know when did you kind of get into going to record shops and you know those um, sort of influences there was, two, there was two joints in particular one that same dude I mentioned earlier I think his name was Rob we never we didn't like I'm still friends with some of those guys this guy was just like my doorway into meeting these other people who I'm still friends with to this day yeah. but there was a joint that he took me to that was right near my high school which was in Pawtucket Rhode Island which is a place mm -hmm. now that has like more stuff going on like some nightclubs and shit but when I was a kid it was like there was like you know like uh one store called Ann and Hope that has since closed from the 70s, like one of those like sort of like Sears and Roebuck kind of shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There nothing there. It was just people living there in old mills that had been shut down. It was, a lot, it was like a mill part mm. of the town. Um, but he took me to a joint there that I still remember the name of called Luke's Record Exchange that was just a crazy underground spot. And it was mostly, it was before CDs. So there were records, but I had no interest in records because I didn't have a record player. But cassettes, you know, oh, yeah. this is like in 
eighties, late eighties. Yeah. And this place had tons of metal and tons of, uh, and punk and a huge bootleg section of cassettes, mm. which was really fucking cool. I still have a Voivod cassette of like live and like Celtic frost, like cassettes from when I was a kid of yeah. them, like terrible, like audience recordings of metal bands that already sounded like shit live probably. Yeah. And, but the main draw there was that they had a huge, um, back patch and like, like pin section. So yeah. you, when I was young, I was like, I want to look the part, you know, like you want to, so I was like, I need to get a Celtic frost t-shirt. Where do you yeah. do that? This joint. And I just remember it was like this old fat guy that ran it and he didn't seem to give a shit about music. And it was like, <laughs> people would bring him stuff he had like bootleg guys that it was like you know big big tape trade back then so people yeah. would trade bootlegs. there's no internet yet yeah and then there was another point near my mom's house that was a really small shop and i don't remember the name of it but it was in a uh like a strip mall really mm. un unseeming fucking joint that had like just it was like they just set up cassettes in there and those guys there was a dude that worked there that would always be like you like that you should like this and he turned me into like bad brains yeah and the cramps and susan yeah. the banshees and it was all cassettes you know so yeah. public, like early hip-hop stuff for me yeah and those were the two joints that like people that work there would always be like you should be probably just trying to sell me shit but be like you should check this out and like like i remember that dude gave me the cramps tape much like the misfits so i was like sounds like fucking elvis and then again like getting completely addicted to it without even being aware that it was happening yeah until, like, listening to the cramps you know i remember i'm going to pull this from sort of behind the curtain because i remember um th those those kind of cassettes and these sort of record fairs traveling record fairs that used to go around and um a, a friend of mine sent me this one which is sort of killing joke from blackburn mm -hmm. in 1985 it was the first time that i went to see them That's and he sent book. me the bootleg of this gig of the show you were at yeah we were That's both funny. at it. We didn't know each other then, but we were both at it. And he That's sent it. he sent me this cassette. It just to, and it used to pick up, you know, those record fairs. They were amazing. Pick up these beauties that it's like, wow. You know, sometimes the quality just sucks. It was just awful. But you just yeah. get it because it was just this. You're looking for the energy. needle in the at the swaps for sure. But man, yeah. that that I I mean, I kind of miss a bit of that hunt and that underground for mm. stuff like the trade, and for instance. But now it's like. I mean, the internet is so insane. Like, if you want to find, like, every now and then it'll be like Metallica bootleg, and there's just a website of like Metallica from 1985, and you're like, fucking hell. And they're like <laughs> horrible audience recordings, but still, like, yeah. something about it. And then you go through, and some of the, it's weird because comment sections, in my opinion, are a toilet everywhere. It doesn't matter what website yeah, you're yeah, on. Yeah. yeah. But um, for some reason, on these weird, nerdy underground, like, punk and metal things, the comment sections are actually some of the only places where I've seen people be like, nice job, mate. And then be like, oh, if you like that, you're going to love this. And it's like these nerds, like <laughs> turning each other on to shit. And there's no negativity in it. Like every now and then there's something like, fuck off. And you're like, wow, this guy, and they kick him off, you know? But it's like one of the weirdly, it's like when you meet a metal band, 90% of the time, you're like, oh, it's really nice guys. Kind of yeah. surprising. You know? I remember I met Mets not that long ago. Oh, yeah, yeah, ago, yeah, yeah. And they were so good live. I'd never heard of them. We were playing like after them at some festival. So we were like watching them and I was like, Jesus Christ, hard act to follow. Yeah. And I was like, they look really mean. Yeah. And then I talked to them afterwards and like, oh, thank you so much. And they're like, we're Canadian. And I was like, oh, there you go. They're <laughs> really sweet guys, you know? And it like, but on stage, like terrifying a bit, you know? I saw, I saw them maybe, oh, three years, three years ago, they sort of came here to London and, um, Played a like a it's kind of quite a small warehouse, quite a yeah. quite a small small sort of room, and the I mean the light show for one thing was just incredible. It's just like this sort of sheet like kind of strobing sort of going on, and and uh, but the, and the sound was just blistering. I mean it really. They're a heavy duty event for sure. I was yeah. they were a nice they were a good band for me to see because. Like I said, I never heard of them at the time. Yeah. So it's like always nice to have a pleasant surprise like that, especially if you're on the road and you're like sitting through garbage all day. And then all of a sudden you're like, fuck, who are these guys? You know? <laughs> I'm not a cynic. I, I will watch every band, but yeah, it's always when you're surprised by a band you never heard of. You've never heard of, yeah. And you get and something. And life, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, like, again, like kind of growing up, like, would you say you were you were kind of like sort of curious to sort of, you know, kind of learn different things and, you know, take kind of yeah. taking different influences. Yeah, that was a big thing for you. To this day, I still, I like all kinds of music, you know, and I think that's mm. pretty obvious by how much I hop around. But yeah. Think, you know, I mean, yeah, there's very little, I mean, I would say only in the traditional old man sense that now I'm like, I don't get the new stuff, but every now and then something even peeks through there with like a new pop album where I'm like, not bad. It just has to be interesting to me. You know, if it can't be this yeah. like 
rhythmic amoebic garbage that's just out there. But, you know, I like I've said this before, but I remember when I first heard Billie Eilish, I was like, huh, finally. Like, I was like, I kind of get it. She's a little creepy, pretty dark, but it's still taking yeah. all these elements of contemporary music that I would never have anything to do with in a million years. Yeah. But, uh, but you know, like, I'm still hungry all the time to hear new stuff, always, you know. We played mm -hmm. with that uh, Turkish, and I think they're Dutch band called uh, Alton Gun. Okay. That's fucking I've, great live. But they were them, another, I don't know much about them, I've heard of them. Just really great live. And they were another band yeah. that I didn't know who they were. And I'm not even, I mean, I like Turkish rock, you know, like I love uh, Erkan Kare and stuff, but I'm pretty surface with that stuff. But they were, spot, I mean, they kind of remind me of like a Turkish shocking blue, really good live. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that, that same festival where we saw Crack, Crack Cloud from mm. Canada, they were fucking incredible. It's always nice to uh, keep you, you know, the day I stopped being interested in hearing new music would be a, a fucking sad day. You know, I think it probably saved my life, music. So. Yeah. I mean, so, I mean, I guess, the, you know, there's a lot, you know, these days, and maybe it's maybe it increased last year because of, of, of sort of COVID, but, you know, music being kind of self-created, you know, created at home, you know, there's a lot of kind of technical stuff that's, that that's you know that's available that is allowing people to kind of create this sort of music in the you know essentially kind of like in the bedroom especially sort of younger kids i guess mm -hmm. yeah i mean uh, now more than ever it's i think probably a lot more accessible for people to make yeah whatever the fuck they want and this year was an interesting one for me i just kept my head down and, and finished and started multiple projects that i knew i could have the time to do yeah but also because of that i've signed up for a bunch of like i love Bandcamp. i think that's a really great site yeah, in yeah. Terms of, yeah find new shit so my new thing is to find a label i like and then i'll like rather than a band specifically like i'll hear a band i like and i'm like oh who put this out and then i'll check out that labels roster and that's been a really interesting way this year to find stuff like there's that label i, th I think he's called it a hustle mountain mm. these guys okay uh cool. really just a weird fucking label they do really interesting stuff super contemporary very digital but like but really out there and just like mm. uh you know, and of course, there's like uh, Finders Keepers is a really good one for like a lot of old reissue stuff. There's just been a lot of good shit this year coming at, coming through. Mm. Some people, I think, nose nose to the stone, trying to get stuff out there for people to have some sort of escape this year. You know? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess guess with with you know, sort of doing taking that approach and you know, finding labels is a good way to, you know understand you well you know you get a good label and you understand the mindset of the people that are running it you know it's okay well you know they're they're, they're really sort of interested in, in finding decent good interesting music to put out and this is something that i can kind of relate to yeah it's like rather than following the author you're like who's this publisher like i've never gone past yeah. the art it's always been interesting to see like i don't know if it has anything to do with the fact that i run a label or not but it's interesting to find like like-minded individuals putting out yeah a, a strong roster in, in my opinion you know which yeah. is yeah but you know and and uh, you, like over over the you, you know kind of years that you've been been in the in the sort of the industry i mean you know from a sort of personal point of view i mean what, what kind of you know what what have you really learned from the you know in terms of, of kind of like mind your, your own sort of mindset what have you really sort of learned from the from your your kind of experience my personal experience is um that you can do a lot of it by yourself, you know, like I got, I mean, I've been very fortunate with the people that I've worked with, but I mean, I still manage the band, you know, like yeah. I, I, I'll get paid out at a festival and they're like, who's your TM? And I'm like, me. me. And then yeah. on stage, like, you're in the band too. And I'm like, well, yeah, I don't need like some person getting a check for me the other night when I'm well capable, but you know, yeah. I mean, I love, there's also been people I've surrounded myself with that have been really beneficial to the cause, think, like Matt Jones from Castleface. Mm. people who can actually make shit happen and michelle yeah. Nat, who books me but i've definitely learned that and especially now more than ever like i think i started it probably before it was like mostly a really punk thing to like diy and like DIY. but now more than ever you you don't need any of this excuse me archaic you know old school booking systems anymore because yeah there's so much out there you know you can get your music out there you can book shows i i think now after covid hopefully, and it seems like it is happening here in LA anyway, that there's a resurgence of the underground of things like venues and yeah. stuff, you know, there's been like, there's been a bunch of crazy ass, like 3000 person 
outdoor generator punk shows here happening in LA. Uh, I don't have social media, but my friends will always hold their phone up and be like, look at this. And there's yeah, like a, yeah. a bonfire and then a hardcore band playing and then a police helicopter flying around, you know? And I think when they were originally showing it to me, they're like, nobody's wearing a mask. And I was like, this is fucking awesome. Like I, my take on it was like, I was like, good. Like, I mean, I was like, you know, we're, we're coming to a close here on this. Yeah. And uh, I think people were, I mean, these kids are freaking out, you know, they're ready. Like we just went and played this weekend and it was like such a great release for us. And yeah. I feel like for the day, you know, it was like, I don't know. Uh, I didn't realize how much I was going to miss touring until yeah. about, about one year hit. And then I was like, and now I have nothing left for this, you know? <laughs> I finally hit the wall of like, I can't entertain myself anymore. I'm anymore, kind of, I'm, I'm kind of exhausted with this. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm tired of myself. Like, I've had enough of fucking me. I even was telling my buddy, I was like, I even miss the people I can't stand. Like, I miss telling some guy, to, I, miss, I miss the aggressive bouncer at the show a little bit. Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. I'm, I'm like, that fucking guy, you know, like, what's the world without that asshole? You know what I mean? So it's like, and, and, and that person makes you appreciate the good people in your life. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. What's, what's, what's kind of like in, in LA, what sort of happened to, to venues? Have a lot of them gone under and... or and, Yeah, or yeah, there's been a bunch. Um, I think a lot of them are still in stasis. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm, there's some bars that are open now. There's venues that have been open on and off, depending on the, the parameters that the government has set. Like there was, you know, for instance, Zebulon is a pretty popular venue here. It's like a middle-sized venue. Yeah. They've been open and closed on and off all year, having no shows, mind you, but outdoor seated drinking with like tables spaced apart, you know. Yeah. And uh that was a little bit of a lifesaver. Now they're now they're like statically waiting for things to reopen. But there haven't really been any real shows in LA except for, mm. for sort of out maybe some outdoor stuff. Yeah. And some sort of punk underground shit. But nobody's open yet for that. You know, the mm. drinks are open. Thank fucking God. I, you know, I didn't drink that much this year because I just kept forgetting yeah. to drink because I don't drink at home. So yeah. I'd be like, I haven't had a drink in a month. Like, it was just weird. Like, I was like, I haven't had a drink in a month. I don't even remember the last time that happened. <laughs> and then the bar opened and they're like, you can come sit outside right now. And I like, I ran there, you know, like, I was like, let's go get a drink. <laughs> but uh, I think LA is slowly starting to open. There's like a crazy... Republican right wing recall of the governor happening here now. Mm. I don't care who you are right now. I feel like there was nobody could do a good job of this. It was such like weird, unprecedented. The last time we had anything like this happen has been like a hundred years. Yeah. So, no yeah. Deal yeah. With this. so to criticize somebody, unless they're out outwardly fucking up, is or like intentionally fucking it up, like Trump, for instance, just like leaving yeah. office again. Um, it's really hard to criticize the governor here for me personally to be like, mm. he did a bad job. I was like, I don't even know what a good job would look like on this. Well, well, that would look like put out this fire. So that being said, it's been interesting. Uh, you know, there's a recall happening for him right now where potentially Caitlyn Jenner is going to run against him. Who is yeah, I, I saw that. And I was like, no, not a Kardashian. Jesus Christ. Like California is funny to me. You know, I've lived here for like almost 27 years, I think. Yeah. And, uh, or something like that. I don't do math too good, but uh, the, I feel like in America, people really hate California if they're from the other side of the fence, you know, like, you know, uh, Republicans in Texas would be like, fuck California. And I'm like, you really have no idea though, because if you came here and you went anywhere besides San Francisco and LA, you would love it. You know what yeah. I mean? Like I was like, there's, there's a lot of people like you here too, man. It's just, you're thinking <laughs> of, you know, Hollywood or whatever. So um, it's, it's, it's coming along here, though. I think they did the best job they could. I was glad when they opened up vaccines for everybody. I was mm -hmm. kind of waiting for my actual turn because I don't have any debilitating, uh, you know, ailments that would get me in early and I'm not. Yeah. Sick. I just talked to my friend who's an American living in Germany right now, this kid on our label, and he was saying that they still in Germany, and this was like a week ago, but they still hadn't opened vaccinations for anybody under 60 yet. And I was like, fuck, really? Like, yeah, yeah. he's got money. You know, I'm sure they have the ability to like open that shit up, like get friends yeah. who didn't want to get the vaccine for whatever reason, you know, it's yeah. time for that. Mm. But for me, I was like, if it means I can get on a plane again and do what I do, then you can yeah. shoot it out of a gun at me. I don't care. Like, let's get this going, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And when I went there, I went to, I have Kaiser, which is a uh, healthcare here. Yeah, and uh, when I went there, it was just like a garage, you know, like a parking garage, mm. or this militaristic, like, like dystopian future setup with like tents, like triage tents. And I walked <laughs> in, and the lady was just like, 
so fast. I was like, ah, and I was like, wow. Like I didn't feel it at all. I was like, amazing. She was so good at giving a shot. And she was like, yeah. dude, I've given out 2000 shots. So like, get the fuck out of my tent, you know, like, <laughs> but it was really, it was, I was, I was impressed. She was like, go sit down. There's some cookies out there. Sit down for 15 minutes, make sure you feel all right. And then yeah. go. Like, it's, same, same with us when we had ours and like very kind of precise sort of operation, you know, you spend far longer actually sort of walking up the stairs to get to where you need to go <laughs> and answering the sort of the, the different yeah. sorts of questions to get in, you get in the, your little booth and then you're there five seconds and that's it. And it's like, Am I, am I done? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Come Next. back in three months' time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Run again. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of like it. I mean, it's it's, it's great that the you know the, some of the venues, some underground venues are kind of opening up again. I mean, that's that's good sign that there's a resurgence and kind of interest in sort of underground. We'll see. I mean, I've also heard here in the states, and this is just hearsay, but I've heard that. Um, like Live Nation and other conglomerate club owners like, you know, uh, AEG or whatever the fuck have been buying up a lot of the venues that have been closing, oh, which really? were probably holdouts initially on selling to them because they were independently owned and run clubs. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a place here called um, The Satellite in LA that used to be called Spaceland. Mm. And I never had a ton of love for the place. I liked it all right, but it wasn't like a place where I'd be like, yes, let's go there. But I, it was yeah. a place that I went to fairly often. They had a lot of comedy shows. It was fun, you know? Yeah. And uh, they closed and I was like, fuck, that sucks. Because it, without realizing it, it was a place that like, I just always kind of expected to be there. I, I'm pretty sure they maybe owned the building. I'm not even sure, but it's just like, mm. gone. So we'll see what happens with some of these venues that have been bought up by more corporate interests, you know, but yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I would be well prepared to go back to playing in warehouses. Uh, yeah. I, mean, I would do that anyway, but I'll, I'll do whatever it takes and I'd happily play wherever, as long as we get to play and meet some people, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. 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 I think, I, I mean, I, 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 I think, I think those, you know, those, those kind of venues are sort of so important. I was, I was reading something today about, um, you know, the, 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 there are quite a, quite a few people who sort of just will not go to sort of smaller venues because they think that, you know, the, those venues are putting on bands that are maybe not the finished product. It's so you know, funny because it's the crazy. opposite for me, where I was like, crazy. I never get to go. To, I, I never get to go to big shows. Totally, you know? I totally agree. Yeah. Every now you. and then I'll be at a big show and yeah. I'll be like, wow, look at this fucking place. It's amazing. Like the drinks are thirteen dollars. You know, like <laughs> we'll see. You know, I'm I to me like there's like a place here in LA that I'm not sure if it's still there. And it was called East Seventh. Uh, it was like a punk venue. Yeah. Where, like I saw like Uranium Club play there. Some other bands over time, but just like a real like gutter punk. Yeah. Well, like I rode my bicycle there and I locked it up out front and like almost immediately somebody's trying to steal it. And I was like, hey! like across the street, the guy like ran away. But I was like, dude, I just, like I locked it up and turned away and he was like up my ass trying to like cut my bike off. I was like, what the fuck, man? I'm not even in the building yet, you know. <laughs> but to me, I was like, that was a really fun night, you know, like um, we'll see. I know. I mean, when we play in like London, for instance, we've still been playing mm. the Troxy, which Troxy. is not. Yeah. Which is like old school. And, yeah. You know, fucking great the people that work there great it's a little dirty it's a little yeah. old school but that's what i want you know like yeah. I, I've never, like, you know i mean all clubs are different obviously but i've never really been a fan of like um polished joints you know like polished for joints. instance no, i agree not that long ago before the pandemic i went and saw elo here at the forum and i'd never yeah. been to the forum before and with my bias of these like big venues yeah i expected to hate it but the people that park were helping us park the car like park over there were like really you know efficient and i was like that was fast and then we walked in the bartender was nice and it was like the beer was like this big and then it was, <laughs> the place was amazing afterwards i was like that, that was like one of the best shows i've ever seen of course it was fucking elo but still i was like yeah. man the fun. and it sort of transcended that new club vibe i think but it's like you know nineteen thousand people could fit in there twenty thousand people wow like yeah old school you know kind of like the troxy where it's just like it hasn't changed since the 60s it hasn't like, changed there against joplin yeah and it's like a difference with like new clubs like i remember we played this joint in the uk in london that's um a, a fucking uh it's like a franchise the o2 academy oh yeah 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 and we played the one in london and i was like this place fucking sucks like the staff were rude nobody knew what the yeah. fuck's going on the sound guy was a dick yeah. and uh every now and then we'll get booked there it's funny it's like just that specific one not i know they have other ones that yeah. I, can't, 
I can't say as whether they're good or not. But I yeah. remember our group was like, you playing at the O2 Academy? I was like, no, we're fucking not. I was like, look <laughs> somewhere else. And that's how we ended up playing at the Troxy. The Troxy. Because I was like, find us something more interesting because I've played there before. And I, all, I remember I literally got into like a fight with the sound guy where I was like, <laughs> really? I'm not doing with you anymore, you dick. You know, like, yeah. I mean, it might have just been specific to the staff that night, but I was like, never Maybe. again, dude. No, the, 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 the Troxy is a great venue. I, remember I, was, I saw uh, Jesus and Mary chained there and they were, oh, yeah, they, were they were supported by uh, this band who they were only very short lived called the Amazing Snakeheads, and they were fantastic. If you ever get a chance to listen to some of their stuff, unfortunately, the 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 lead singer uh, died um, a couple of years ago. I think it was. Uh, he got you know had brain cancer. It was really sad because uh, he was so, they, they were such a talented band. And they had they had a real kind of like I think a really strong future. Right. Quite quite a sort of volatile band, but really good. And um, yeah, they supported the Mary Chain at uh, at the Troxy. I saw them on their own play at the, the Electric Ballroom in in, uh, in Camden in London. That's mm. another good. That's a good venue. I like that joint. I think we're actually booked there. I don't know if it got cancelled or what. I can't keep track of the shows anymore, man. They're yeah, really moved around. You know, I have seen Jesus and Mary Chain a couple times though, and I remember. I was pretty loaded one of the last times I saw them. And I, I was like, I feel like I'm just standing in front of a fucking jet engine. Like it was just like <laughs> off stage, you know, like I blew my hair back. And afterwards, uh, I, 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 my ears are so cooked anyway after all these years. But I remember after the show being like, I was like, fuck, yeah. I can feel it. Like it was like, well, I, really, I took a thing. It was interesting because this this um this venue here at uh, King George's in, in in Blackburn that was where I first saw the Mary Chain. That was like it again. I think it was probably the same year, eighty five, eighty six. Like I think it was club. when sort of Psycho Candy came out. Mm-hmm. Incredible! It, it was like a twenty minute show. It was the, yeah. that was the you know when they were they were kind of like very unruly and you know it was like the the you know the twenty minute show and it was just a this sort of blast of noise. I mean, it really was. It was just just kind of. Brutal. They were a sonically brutal. aggressive. I would sonically aggressive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, not not for the faint of heart so much, you know. No, absolutely. Yeah. I feel like sound people sometimes try and mix out these offensive frequencies, which I totally get. They're like, you know, you gotta get that 4K out of there. And I've always felt like Jesus and Mary Chain was one of those bands are like, we need more 4K. Yes. And like, I want the people in the front row to have a bit of a nosebleed and their beer is foaming <laughs> over while we're playing, you know. Pretty cool. <gasps> With um, I, I mean, you know, kind of like when you when you sort of find bands that you you know you mentioned a couple sort of early, you know, the sort of the Turkish and Dutch bands. You know, if you you sort of find those bands, does that kind of like inspire you to to get in touch with them and you know think about collaborating with them? Are you, are you a big you yeah, know, I've, I've reached out to so many bands in my time. I mean, I definitely kind of developed a you know just via email relationship with the Crack Cloud people. Yeah. Uh, you know, offering to put out, reissue their first two EPs in uh, the States because they had never come out proper here. I think they only mm. came out in Europe. And uh, they were like, you know what? We're actually going to do what you do and put out our own records. And I was like, do it. You know, like, mm. that would be, that's the best case scenario to me is that they control all, all <clears throat> excuse me, all their own rights and, uh, yeah. you know, everything from start to finish. But like, definitely like there's a, a fantastic band from New York right now called Gustav, who are really great live and my buddy was just like, we should go check this band out. And they were fucking great. And I almost immediately emailed them. I'll, I'll write bands all the time online. Like if I buy something off Bandcamp and I like I, that, there's a guy who I believe is uh, from the UK named uh, Lawrence Pike, jazz guy. A, yeah. A, yeah. A guy. I yeah. reached out to him through Bandcamp and just sent him a letter and he, we wrote back, you know, we corresponded a bit, but like his records are like drums with like uh, triggers and samples like synthesizer samples so he just plays the kit and it's just the, the, the records are really fascinating to me interesting beautifully recorded but yeah. I, I i'm there's like a little blue law with me when you play a festival if you're playing with another band even if you're not the same kind of people or same kind of band you have to acknowledge each other so yeah. we always we have like this joke in the band where like if another band is like even if they're shy if they're unfriendly in any way i'm like what a bunch of dicks like i was like you just gotta be like what's up you know i was like that's all it takes so like it's pretty rare that you'll play with somebody who's like literally like stonewalls you, but mm-hmm. I I've taken that to like the next level, like reaching out to people online and like trying to work with. There's some bands we're doing reissues for now. I mean that's how I met Armando Nava from Los Dug Dugs. Uh, somebody put me in touch with him, so we've been talking and uh, people like Tradgrass Oxnar and uh, mm. and uh, even. Um, I mean, fuck, I, I will like dig up. I, I've been inspired by people like Mississippi Records and Finders Keepers. Yeah. When, if you find something 
that's $800 on Discogs that's 40 years old. You're like, well, fuck this. Let's try and find somebody from the band and do this record yeah. again. And you'll look at the comment. That's another funny comment section on Discogs because it's so snooty. But there'll be somebody be like, $800? You know, you're like, somebody reissue this shit already. And I'm like, I'm that guy. Like, that's how we... <laughs> That's how we fucking put out that fall live record recently was uh, Mark Riley, who we've become friends with over the years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just a fellow music nerd. He uh, he sent us a YouTube link and he's like, boys, check out this great show I played in 82. It's a great recording. And then I was like, Full. Yeah. we should put this out immediately. Like, it's so good, you know. And there <laughs> were people in that comment section on YouTube being like, I wish there was a bootleg of this. And I was like, we can make that happen. You we know? can like, make that happen. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, mean, that, but, that's, I mean, I mean, you know, kind of like this the the fall fans uh i mean incredible i mean you know just Jesus. so kind of knowledgeable and intense rabid as well the guy the guy that oh. ran that uh that youtube channel told me to fuck off <laughs> when i asked him for the files so we we told him to fuck off back in the in the bio for the record i wrote i sent the guy's response to mark riley and he had a laugh he's like classic fall fan i was like what a dick you know but it was like it, it did make me laugh. I was like, yeah, that makes sense. You know, like I've met Marky Smith. I know what kind of people are emulating him. I understand <laughs> anger, you know? Oh, that's brilliant. I mean, I, 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 I guess, I mean, I mean, I guess, you, you know, sort of like you do sort of reaching out to, you know, anybody that sort of comes across you, that you come across. I mean, you just, you don't know what's going to happen. You don't, you know, something beautiful might, come out of that i mean it's i mean i guess a lot a lot of people well it, it, there it can be a sort of tendency not to, just not to do that and just listen to it and think okay well that's, that, that's kind of fine but to to actually kind of go out to them and see what opportunities that might bring up yeah. you know Apparently, from a creativity point of view and, and just a personal you know kind of intellectual and stimulation point of view is just brilliant i mean it's the way to do it isn't it but apparently there's also a 50% chance that they'll tell you to fuck off. Fuck off know? as well. <laughs> yes. Luckily, I'm the perfect candidate for that. I can take, I've been told to fuck off a thousand million times in my life. But uh, yeah, I mean, like, you'll never know unless you reach out to people. And I would, say, try. I would say most of the time people are really friendly and receptive. Or, yeah. you know, you know, I mean, you go in flattering, of course. If, of if course. Just, like, that's the first, you start with how great their shit is, you know? Like, I mean, you've, sort of, you've sort of worked out the pattern over the years of how to do that's this. That's how you get in the door. You'd be like, <laughs> love the new record, you know? But, uh, <laughs> yeah, well done. All your back catalog. I mean, a lot of these people, it's funny, like, I'll, I'll write to a band and be like, fuck, I just heard this song and I really like it. And then I immediately went on Discogs and blew like 80 bucks on all your old seven inches. You yeah. know, like, uh, God, last week I heard a band that somehow I missed out on that was from New York called Dawn of Humans. You ever heard that shit? No, no. Some of the people from, um, what is it? Uh, uh, Hank Wood and the Hammerheads. Really like okay. freak punk, like aggressive, weird art punk. But man, that Dawn of the Humans record uh, just blew my mind. And if you look up photos of that band playing live, the singer would be like, looks, you ever seen uh, Tetsuo's Iron Man, that Japanese no. movie? No, no. Like, this guy would just wear, like, trash and be painted, you know, his body painted with his dick out, like, really <laughs> some very uh, avant live experiences that seem really visceral, but the records are great, and it's super grindy, really. It's basically hardcore, but, like, almost like Void or something, where it's, like, pretty off, like, yeah. weird. Um, but, yeah, like, I'm still, like, this year I went down a real deep hardcore hole where I was, like, somehow in the early aughts there was like this amazing wave of like swedish hardcore and all these like weird like teutonic yeah northern european states being like you know it's so perfect here i'm mad here's our record you're like holy shit this is like really aggressive <laughs> this, is, this is sort of dark and brutal <laughs> yeah yeah i definitely got through the year by listening to a lot of very aggressive music i was even revisiting white house i was just like wow this is what i want to hear right now that seems really wow. appropriate. um do you, also, do you sort of do you, do, you, do you kind of tend to do that? Do you, you sort of get a, 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 a I wouldn't call it a fixation, but a, but no, I do. Yeah, let's call it a fixation. Yeah, on a on a on a particular Sorry. kind of thing. I will. Yeah, like I'll definitely uh, go down a rabbit hole of a genre or of a specific um, group of people making music. You know, a lot of those bands too, like totalitar for instance like they share members with other bands too so like i would like find them and then find that like i heard a band the other day 
totally unrelated to hardcore a band called from Sweden from the early 2000s called the Hip Whips. You ever heard that band? I've heard of them. Fuck, Again, I don't yeah. know much this about it. playing a little like uh, organ, like a B3 style organ, a drummer and a bass player. And the guy's got a really crazy set of pipes. He almost sounds like Van Morrison or like right. Pro, Pro Call Harum. Yeah. Real 60s, 70s organ pop but like a really yeah. good songwriter and i went on this crazy rabbit hole two nights ago i heard one of their songs in a swedish movie and i was like what is this because i th thought it was an old song turns out it's these guys from the 2000s who only had a couple cds and there's nothing about them on the internet like it's impossible so it's just like really? I found a handful of things and then i found the dude's name that's the singer and he's really striking looking as well and just a great songwriter man it's i mean it just sounds like that like pro call harm like real heavy weird yeah seven pop but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of weird when when you when you know, especially sort of these days when you see nobody when you see like a band or no kind of individuals got virtually yeah. no kind of internet imp. It, Very weird. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's so much shit out there that's fully covered on the internet to find yeah. something that is quite good in my opinion, and to be like, oh, there's nothing about there's this. There's nothing. On the internet. There's one video of them playing live on a Swedish TV show, I think, and it's incredible. Yeah, and then like, even on Discogs, there's no videos linked. So I was just buying CDs, which I never buy. I was like, all right, I'm gonna buy their CDs, and like based on the fact that this song was good, hoping that the records are this good. And then I finally heard them, and they're fucking great, you know. But just like, yeah, it's very strange to have such a small footprint right now when it's almost by accident. Yeah. You multiply in the ether of the internet. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. Um, what, what do you what do you find with with your uh, sorry I was going I was going to say um you, when you go into the into a sort of particular sort of genre so let's take you know kind of like the Swedish sort of hardcore do you do you find that that then sort of influence translates into an influence in into what you're writing absolutely totally. yeah, well, yeah it always makes me want to play more aggressively when you just want to go and every time I crash my bicycle away. into hardcore or it's like watching the show Mad Men and you're like I kind of want a whiskey and a cigarette right now. <laughs> <laughs> It's two in the afternoon and I was like, there, you know, it's like, I'm, I'm a perfect audience for susceptibility. Like I'm always ready for nonsense. And like, yeah, like I will say if I'm listening to particularly heavy music, I will find its way into my music, but also vice versa. Like if it's, you know, um, something more avant-garde or improvisational or mellow, mm. that'll help me too. I think it was just this year. I had to pull out the big guns of getting back into metal and punk because this year was so grueling. Yeah. You know? And, uh, yeah, it was like, like my girlfriend, I would wait till she left town and then have like three days solid of listening to very aggressive music at home because uh, <laughs> that's not something that you want to play for people who aren't in the mood, you know what I mean? Be like, do you mind if I put on this live yeah. Slayer bootleg right now? They're like, ah, you know. It's like, it's while, like, while you're gardening, can I put this fucking metal on, you know? Yeah, it's, it's those sort of three words, isn't it, of read the, read the room. You yeah, sort of yeah, like, oh, no, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I, I shouldn't have been accommodating when she's around. I'm like, okay, we can listen to Sun Ra, you know, it's all good. <laughs> but uh, when the second she leaves town, I'm like, uh, yeah, like uh, suffocation is going right on the record player. Yeah. Do you think what, what, what um, do you, do you think that there's, um, I mean, one thing that I noticed from going, going to gigs, and I don't know, maybe, I mean, maybe it's the, maybe it's the type of gigs that I was going to, but there seemed to be a, more of a sort of, wider age diversity you, you know kind of like sort of younger kids to you know kind of like older people and and, and everybody sort of in between sort of going mm -hmm. to gigs seem to be sort of more of that which which kind of goes against that you know some of the stuff that's happening in society around age which is like that, that we're, we're almost like sort of put into age boxes or brackets and there's and and you know kind of like never the twain shall meet i mean do you, do you think yeah I think I think maybe what I take from that is that a lot of younger bands right now are emulating stuff that some of these older cats can get into. So like, you know, I'll meet sometimes we'll be at a show and we'll meet a husband and wife who are like in their 60s and they're like, hey, you know, we're talking to them at the merch table and they're interesting because they've seen fucking everything. Yeah. And they literally will like list off shows that they'd been at back in the day. And I'm like, oh my God, like these people were there. Yeah. And then the younger kids, I mean, the way music is now it couldn't be more different than it was 30 years ago, 40 years mm. ago, 50 years ago. So I think to me, the real alternative to contemporary music is to dig back uh, into the past a bit or to go so far out into the future that like, uh, it's just like, you know, I'm always curious what the next thing is, you know, but I think that yeah. 
crowds are finding more common ground in terms of age for sure we have a lot of old heads coming to our shows and a lot of young people you know but it's yeah. like it's funny like the, like we'll meet an old guy and have like kind of reminded me of deep purple and then somebody else will be like sounds like ty siegel like a young kid so it's really that's that's where the difference lays is there how they will compare us to something you know and so. how they'll sort of interpret the either the kind of the visual or the sound and you know what what that means to them yeah yeah I, I mean, we, we've been pretty blessed with uh, a pretty wide range of types of people that come to our shows, thank God. Mm. You know, we don't have a particular type of person. I'm always impressed when I meet uh, people at the merch table or whatever, like all walks of life, all ages, all types of people. That's really cool to me. I, I, I love having a diverse fan base. I mean, do, you really do, do, do you think sort of, you know, generally as a sort of society that we're, we're kind of too close-minded, you know, to, you know, to, to other just other thing, things that are kind of different and yeah. stepping outside comfort zones? I would say, especially now, yeah, I would say there's mm. a lot of uh, people who are very uncomfortable with the rate of change that's happening now. Yeah. Like we're exponentially moving faster than we ever have. Very fast, yeah. Especially with progressive ideas, for instance, in the States. I can only speak for the States because I live here, but yeah. I do see in people, you know, some people that I'm related to, for instance, that are just there, it's really just fear yeah. of, uh, change you know and and it's yeah. it's also like you know like what why would you fight this like you know every generation gets progressively more progressive i feel like we're moving towards a world i think where people are all intermingled you know i feel like the perfect example i always brought up was like i was like yeah look at me i'm like bright pink how am i gonna how would any offspring of mine survive on this planet that we've destroyed if 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 there's not racial intermingling you know what i mean like people like coming yeah. together to create a stronger humankind yeah. and um, i mean this is really just off topic but um no no not know, at all no. I, feel like, I feel like people are people are a lot of people 50 percent of our country i would say can be boiled down to greed and fear of things yeah. you know and uh to me it's just it's pointless to argue against it because it's where we're going. You know, I mean, I, that's always been how it's been with the old generation, you know, in yeah. with the, in with the new out with the old, it's, it's a tough time, but I think maybe now it's just moving way too fast for a lot of those people to wrap their minds around. You know what I mean? Like I watched people in our Congress speak and I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, <laughs> you know, we didn't have the internet before the internet has definitely lit, thrown some gas on the fire of change. You know, it's, uh, it's moving. Well, this is it. I mean, you I mean, you're totally right. You know that 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 kind of rate of change, the and the 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 kind of complexity that that comes with that as well. I mean, it's yeah, it's it, it's it, it's not easy. And I think that you know the way that that we're we're kind of structured, you know, in society doesn't, you know, laws don't keep up with things the way that kind of like no. institutions behave. It, it can't keep up with those sort of things. So everything is kind of lagging behind, where people have to be and want to be. Mm -hmm. and it, and it's like and, and that kind of creates this sort of tension if you're like well we want to be here but we can't because this is holding us back i'm sure now it's worse than it ever was because the government has always been a slow bureaucracy so i can't imagine i mean people have been wanting change ahead of when it was um, mm. feasible in the eyes of the government for as long as people have been around i'm sure with any sort of government yeah. but um <clears throat> yeah you're right i mean it's uh it, it's amazing to me that uh the old ways are not being able to keep up with the new way, you know? Yeah. So uh, I, I can't imagine growing up right now, like being a kid. I feel like when I was a kid, I was so blissfully ignorant. And now I'm so fucking over informed, informed that I'm exhausted all the time. Yeah. I literally have to check out of stuff because I Absolutely. can't handle yeah. it anymore. You know, I don't have the brain. Like, I feel like, you know, generation Z or whatever the fuck they're called, the new kids are going to yeah. have so much more, uh, Either either they're going to be have the attention span of a gnat, or they're going to be like all memory space capabilities for Just keeping take up everything in. I can't, I can't, I don't know yet. We'll have to wait and see. Yeah, but they'll either be plugged into a tube on their phone, or they'll know everything all at once. You know, it's like uh, very complicated. Do you, do you do you take do you take some some you know kind of influence and inspiration from that that younger generation going back? You know, kind of like 20, 20 sure. years. It's inspiration my, for you. Well, from my own my own youth, absolutely, because that was you know. Like I said, blissfully ignorant, I was probably pretty happy then. Yeah. Being the things that I was in. So a lot of what I do now is sort of holding on to some of that, but also a lot of the shit now, like there's so much interesting uh, fodder for music right now outside yeah. of the standard, like things like even as simple as like facial recognition software. It's like fucking terrifying. 
but I also understand sort of the good, like I understand both sides of the argument about stuff like AI to me is, and we were starting off small where people like let Alexa into their house so they can have some robot lady that turns on the song you want or will tell you how to cook lasagna. Yeah. But to me, I was just like, no, I'm good, thanks. <laughs> um, but it's just, you know, it's like, I, I can't imagine how exhausting it must be to like mm. have like, somebody who's like cognizant coming up of age right now to be like, okay, so I know how this works. I, th- I always go back to that. There's a Norm McDonald bit that I had on this bootleg of him doing comedy where he's like, when I was six, I remember being on the street and there were like planes flying overhead and there were cars and people walking and everybody was busy. And I just walked up to this businessman on a street corner and I tugged on his sleeve and he looked down and I said, hey, what the fuck is going on? And I was just like, <laughs> yeah, like I can't, I can't imagine that version of that now as like one million times more extreme. Yeah. This is a lot to take in right now, you know? I mean, I know you 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 you're not really sort of on on so well not on social media or anything, but I think you know if you look at the you know kind of like the Instagrams and you know this 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 kind of like high pressure, you know you you're seeing people doing stuff all the time, and it's just like you know that people kind of get very anxious, you know, seeing seeing all this this kind of stuff going on and this constant need to differentiate yourself and sort of be different to stand out from the crowd. What's well, the thing, you know, I, if I think like when I, when I was a kid, you know, I, I kind of, I didn't really want to stand out. You know, I didn't want to be the one that was really different that got a kicking from a group of kids at school and <laughs> stuff like that. You want to kind of yeah. fit in in some way, you know, so that, that there's, there's, a, there's a hard balance, I think, for, for kind of, you, you know, that, that younger generation now. I, I think personally, I think social media is probably one of the worst things ever to happen in the human race. Yeah. That being said, the internet is... A I mean, really amazing tool and, and yeah. people do connect and a lot of amazing shit still comes from it. So it's really hard to throw it all away in my mind at once. Yeah. But I do know how it makes me feel when somebody sticks their fucking phone in my face to show me some <laughs> horse shit. And I'm just like, you know, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm just too old. I'm 46 and I don't want anything to fucking do with it. I see it as a business tool. You know, we have yeah. one, we have an Instagram for the label, but yeah. it's literally just for announcements. And like, yeah. It's been really interesting seeing the entire world have a free platform to reach out. And it's a real mixed bag of like mm. really positive things and really negative shit. But I yeah. like, I'm so grossed out by the incessant uh, omniscient peanut gallery vibe of it. And also people just putting up these bulldog fronts of how their life is better than your life yeah. or whatever the fuck. You know, I have a lot of friends who I watch deal with the crisis of just being in that every day that I met this one buddy where I'm like just get off man like he's miserable with it too he's like he's like (laughs) arguing with people on there I'm like what are you doing dude I was like that and like okay the perfect example is speaking of the label one um every now and then there'll be like somebody will come on our label uh you know Instagram whatever and just say something horrible yeah not related to anything in particular just just like saying a horrible thing and I'll be like Matt we got to shut this down. Like, you know, then people are arguing with this person or whatever that people are fighting on there. All of a sudden I'm like, what the fuck? It's a record release for a band, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and now we'll look at it and, he'll, and like, he would know better than me, but he'll be like, Oh, it's a bot. And I'm like, how do you know it's a bot? And he's like, I don't know. It's like spelled all wrong. And he's like, look, they only have two posts and it's just really negative shit. On yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I'll be like, so people are just on there arguing with potentially a robot. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, this sucks. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I was like, I kind of miss the old days where I was like, you can't really fight a Russian bot. That's a tough one. So <laughs> oh. I don't know, man. It's just so complicated, you know, so that's what I'm trying to, only thing I can say is you got to try and be a good person yourself because you'll never really change anybody else necessarily. Like it's really mm-hmm. just about trying to be a dick. So that's what, that's where I'm at these days. That's like, where you're at these days. Yeah. Try Try not to be a dick. I'm just, it's like as simple as that. It's like a good mantra to live by. Like, you know, only take it out when it's necessary. But it's like, uh, yeah, you know, it's like, uh, it's, I can't imagine being like a teenager right now, you know? So yeah. It's a, lot, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot. For somebody to who is brand new. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. John, thank you so much. That's really wonderful. Yeah, we've left it on a real high note, haven't we? We have. <laughs> we have. Yeah, well, everybody's gonna go like that. Don't be a dick. Yeah, yeah, don't be a dick. That's that seems like a good closing statement, actually. <laughs> uh, a total pleasure, huh? 
and uh, thanks, good John. Luck yeah, out there. absolute pleasure. Don't be a dick. Don't, Don't be, be a dick. dick. <laughs> See you later, man. Cheers, John. Thanks for listening to the show, and I really hope that you enjoyed it and that you'll tune in for the next episode. In the meantime, it would be really awesome if you could rate and review the show and also share it with any friends who you think might enjoy it.